To his right is sitting Tom Healy, he's a writer, collector and director of the Miami Book Fair. He's the chairman of the Fulbright Board and a Monroe Fellow at the Poetry Foundation. And to my left, Claire Beutel is a curator and writer, South African born and based between New York, Miami and El Salvador. She works as the chief curator of Marte Contemporary and is the co-editor of Yes. Together with uh, Simon Vega, artist, lives and works in La Libertad, El Salvador, and co-edited this book with Claire. So, I wanted to have, before we start, I would like to ask a question. Who in the audience has already been to El Salvador? Percentage. <laughs> so, um, for those who have not, Mario, could you just make a brief introduction about your, your country and what marks its culture? That's a really good question. Well, El Salvador is situated in Central America. Uh, originally, was part of Mexico, so our culture really is derived from the Mexican culture. Uh, in the uh, 1820s, the Central American region became independent from Mexico, and I always say we are the tail end of Mexico. So, as I was growing up, uh, the big apple for me was Mexico City. It was not New York or Miami, or Miami didn't really exist, or LA. So that's where the culture really is derived. I think the arts, the visual arts, theater, um, literature, dance, and the culinary uh, arts, it's very tied to the Mexican culture. For the ones that uh, know you and your collection, we're wary of the importance that uh, you always gave to the presence of artists from your home country, uh, amongst the international ones, and um, how you've been always uh, very keen in supporting our programs focused on conceptual art and avant-garde movies in El Salvador. But today, you're, uh, we're launching this, this book, and uh, I would like to know how the idea of this book came, uh, came across, and uh, maybe you could also tell us something about the meaning of the title? Sure. Uh, the title, YES, stands for Generation Y, El Salvador, uh, and it's really more of a YES, collect contemporary from El Salvador, uh, instead of being passive. And it was a collaboration between Simone, Claire and I that the title came around. The idea of the book, I really don't know where it, it all started, but I think it started from 15 years ago. Uh, when I got involved with the contemporary art scene, I met Tom Healy. Uh, he and Amy Capellazzo took me to the first Venice Biennial. And I was very saddened to see that El Salvador was not there. And they explained to me why. <laughs> they said there because there's nobody taking, uh, t taking paying attention to make a movement to create a, a, a path for the artists to be able to get to the Venice Biennial. So I quickly understood that that was the first thing that we needed to do in El Salvador, is to create a collective effort to be able to get out of El Salvador and be part of the international scene. And since then, I've been documenting in my mind and photographs and with my friends uh, kind of every step of the way. Uh, with the hopes to one day make a movie or a book or a website. I didn't know what it was going to be about. But the idea of the book was one day Simone, Claire and I were sitting down and we said, nobody's done a book about contemporary art of El Salvador. Let's be the first ones. And that is. So Sam, may I interject a little something about the title? So I haven't talked to Mario about this, but you know, I think there's a play of uh, young British artists as well. But, but there's another private joke in the title here. And on this first trip with Amy and Mario and me to the Venice Biennale, uh, Amy speaks Spanish as well. We were looking at something and I asked Mario to translate it from Spanish into English to me, and so I, I didn't quite get the meaning. And he told the translation, and uh, Amy said, no. <laughs> and our is a native uh, Spanish speaker, but so, this has become, you know how when you make nicknames for people, or you have these experiences that become just kind of uh, 
symbols for everything with you. So, no, has just been, we can look at each other in certain circumstances and say no. And the opposite of yes. is this enthusiasm for the culture he knows so well. So, I've had, if it's your unconscious or something, I think yes is response to that. You didn't only say yes to the book, but much um, earlier you um, started this exhibition program, and I think it was in Washington DC for Salvadorian artists. Could you tell us about this program and how it en ended up founding with the Museum of Art in El Salvador, the um, RTC? Um, so this is about four years after my first biennial, uh, that I went with Tom and Amy. I was being a volunteer at the embassy and the consulate of El Salvador in Washington, D.C., and they were looking for a new space, a new real estate space. And they asked Robert, my spouse, to see if, they, if he could help find a new space. And I told the uh, Minister of Cultural Affairs, I said, I will have him find you the new space if the new space has a space for art. And that's how the whole thing started. Uh, then I went to my first official visit to El Salvador, uh, to understand what's going on with the art scene, who is who, who were the artists that everybody was talking about. And there was a collective called Adobe, and it was composed of about five artists, and one of them is Simone. Uh, so I met Simone in 1999, uh, when he was, I don't know if you were still in school or a baby, I don't know, you were, maybe, were you already of age? I'm not sure. <laughs> then I reveal it. <laughs> Uh, and that's how I got involved with the contemporary art scene. Uh, they took me to all these kind of underground uh, things that were happening in El Salvador. Uh, there was a house that was going to be a big mansion that was going to be torn down uh, to make way for a new uh, housing development. And before they were tearing down the mansion, uh, this uh, cigarette brand called Parliament was sponsoring the first intervention exhibit by contemporary conceptual artists in the country. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. They're making art like the ones that I saw with Tom in the Venice Biennial. And then the question arose again, why are we not in the Venice Biennial? So, um, so uh, may maybe Simon, uh, um, Simon you, you can tell us about Adobe. I think you, your career started as a graphic designer, as there was no art school. In or, or uh, Salvador, maybe you could tell us about how you met the artists that you found in Adobe together and what kind of projects you did. Yeah, I think also to uh, important to uh, say that this happened right after the war. The war ended uh, in 1992 in El Salvador, the Civil War. So during that time there was no school or university. I mean, it was mostly turned down. So if we wanted to study art or we wanted art, but there was nowhere really to go except graphic school, graphic design school. So a lot of the artists that you're seeing, like Walterio, Ronald, uh, Danny, many of us, they wound up going to a design school, and that's where we met. We met a long time ago. And then we studied, and then 10 years passed, and when I came back, I, I, at the end, I, I studied art in Mexico, and when I came back, uh, we were together, and we figured that we wanted to do new things, we wanted to push a little further, uh, we were all doing painting, drawing, and everything, but we wanted to do more interactive work, uh, public spaces, and collaborative work. So that's why how we all got together to form this collective and made a point to make art that wasn't uh, just from one or the other, but really was all of us creating a new stuff and putting it out on the streets. And thanks to Mario, we also got to travel as a group to, to Washington, D.C., and we showed our work there. And uh, thanks to the program and Mario's support, then we all started also coming out of El Salvador a little bit more and experiencing the international art scene, which is of course so different from, because you have to understand that El Salvador, uh, we were like orphanage. I mean, there wasn't any support, there still is very little support, uh, government or private. So these uh, things were stimulating and very important for all our careers. How has uh, has Marte say then uh, affected your, uh, your work and career? What has it done for the artists? In El Salvador? Be nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is my chance to get you back. No, it's really been a wonderful. I think one of the important things, I guess, a lot of people uh, they don't think that much is happening in El Salvador, or there's not really way to connect uh, places, curators with artists. So we don't have really any of the machinery 
that you have here, like collectors and press and publications and all kind of things. So we were very intuitively working, but thanks to Marte Contemporaneo, that added a, a structure to what we were doing. And more important also, it started bringing a lot of people, like for example, Claire came thanks to Marte Contemporary. Contemporary. That's how we met, that's how we started working together. It's been a, a wonderful relation so far. So um, we really uh, were very happy to have this because otherwise we really didn't have any support or the chance to travel or people from outside to see our work. So I think that was the most important thing and it has been growing and evolving since. So, um, so Claire, as you're running uh, this program, maybe you can tell us, uh, like give us a glimpse of like how does the art scene in El Salvador look like? What kind of institution and structures do exist, and uh, how is Marte say like uh, um, uh, being part of that? Sure. So. Um to kind of sum it up in a very general way, the contemporary art scene in El Salvador is uh, incredibly small, um, but I feel like the artists are doing work that, are, that is, is experiment, very experimental and, and fascinating. So there really aren't any formal structures around a lot of the art pra practice there, and that's really defined the kind of work that has been made o over the last few years. Um, the Spanish center there does fantastic exhibitions and Marte Contemporary has actually played a very significant role um, kind of in this very eclectic way it fulfills the role of kind of a non-for-profit space as well as a mu museum space and so the program has had to kind of adapt uh, over the last uh, now 10 years uh, in order to kind of fulfill the, the needs of what's going on in the art uh, community. And the reason why I actually got over there is because there really aren't any contemporary art curators to speak of. Um, and so I think a big focus of the program going forward is to start some kind of a cur curatorial workshop so that we're able to start um, some kind of curatorial pra practice. Um, so to tell you a little bit more about Ma Marte Contemporary, uh, as I said, it's been going for 10 years. Mario uh, has been a huge supporter of that. Um, and a big focus of the program was to invite artists from around the world to come and show. And the idea is that this would really start some kind of exchange. Um, another focus was to bring guests in. So, for example, uh, Mario brought my, myself and has brought uh, a number of other curators uh, uh, and people to write uh, who come in to, to visit the, the, the community and literally um, made us, I think he made me do like 42 studio visits in like two days. Uh, so you really get a very in-depth uh, uh, idea of what's going on. Um, right now, the the exhibition program has actually expanded. I've been with Marte Contemporary for one year. And we got a fantastic donation from Retna, uh, who is an artist uh, from, uh, whose mom is actually from San Salvador, and we brought him over to come and meet the community. And he was so enthralled with it, he actually gave us some support to expand our exhibition, our, our exhibition pro program. So we're not only showing artists from elsewhere, we're also very much trying to um, develop the, um, the art scene there so that uh, our arts from El Salvador can show within the new museum space as well. Um, I think I'd like to add one quick Yeah, thing. please. I think it's important to uh, point out that art from El Salvador is the diaspora, right? Like Red now. So that I think maybe if you can talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Absolutely, and in fact, that's some, something that really did come out of this book. Um, we actually began with the idea of only interviewing about 10 people for the book and ended up being 28, because we really realized that the conversation about El Salvador is not within a geographic space. It's very much a conversation, conversation that is um, around the world. That's largely due to the fact that there was, as Simon said, a civil war, and so a lot of people actually did leave uh, and a lot of um, in fact El Salvador actually runs a lot of money that comes back from the US so it has a very complex relationship with people actually from there and a large part of our book is really about expanding the conversation beyond the boundaries of El Salvador for sure. What else uh, did you take away from this process of making the book? What are the learnings from it? Um, that's a really good 
question. I feel like the history of El Salvador is always compartmentalized within the context of war, and it's such a, it, it's such a much more complex conversation than, than, than just that. And we actually extracted four key themes um, throughout the process of doing this book. Um, um, the history of war, uh, the way in which Arthur excels, um, uh, in fact, Ronald Moran, uh, in two, in, ten years ago, sold a monumental piece at the Art, Basel Art Fair. I had no idea that this even happened. Uh, so little things like that have really kind of come to, together. Um, what, what were the other things? I guess that also oh, one thing that when we were talking at the beginning of the book, and um, I said to, I remember saying to Mario and Claire, like, do we really have like that much stuff outside to make a book about? You know, do we really have like artists out there and like, exhibiting international enough to make a book? And and like Mario said, you will be surprised. You'll be surprised. So making the book, just the, putting everything together, seeing in retrospective and, and having an historical sense of these stories that are not being told. I, I thought that was great, right? And something to also to to to, to mention. Sorry, do you want yeah. to do it? The inside cover of the book, which was done by Simone. It's actually the timeline that we, uh, during the uh, research for the book, uh, came about to find out all these amazing things that had happened uh, by artists of El Salvador, in El Salvador, and around the world that he didn't know, that I didn't know, and she didn't know, but putting all this information together, we were able to say, wow, this is really amazing, it needs to be documented. So you said you started with one or two ten and uh, ended up doing 28 interviews. What was the selection criteria for people to be uh, in that book? It really began um, looking at kind of friends and family because, as I mentioned, the art community and had begun in a well is is quite small and the people who'd actually been to El Salvador were few. So we really began with them uh, and then as that went on. We, we made a selection of 10 guests who we knew for sure had been to El Salvador, mostly through the Marte Contemporary Program. Speaking to them, they they kept on adding to that conversation, uh, saying you have to speak to so-and-so, you have to speak to so-and-so, and so the conversation really expanded and went through, again, through it the It goes back to this timeline, and I think that when you look at the timeline, every entry, we realize, oh, that was Sam Keller. Oh, that was Tom Healy. So we realized all the different people that we needed to interview to complete the timeline. And look up over here near the end. Simone, Claire, and Mario almost have a nervous breakdown as deadline approaches. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom, you're really, really early um, 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 on in this in this timeline. Maybe you can tell us a little bit. Um, about the advice that you uh, uh, gave Mar uh, Mario, and, and, and why, uh, why is that? That um, from what experience did you give him this advice? You know, Sam. Um, one of the great things about the art world is friendship. You no, know, so I would never say I gave advice to Mario. We had a way of. Uh, we and our partners became good friends, and there's always this way you explore things together, and you're having conversations and uh, doubts and questions. But the Mars way too generous about this. He took to the water immediately. So you know, it's uh, it wasn't really anything anybody taught. We all learned a lot together. When in your timeline did you get involved with um, and start collect artists from Latin America? Well, so we actually took a trip to Cuba together. We've been to Cuba now four times, and I think the first uh, piece I bought was a Los Carpinteros piece, and I was just uh, what I loved about their work was it makes this kind of sexiness and fantasy, but with real physical making, you know, and relish for objects. It's kind of magic realism, but, you know, with the calluses of uh, actual practicality in it. And things in it. There was something about that that showed uh, something that seems somewhat lost from the North American art. Uh, 
a playfulness that uh, and whimsy that still come with the urgency of every day and and a real locality. And what I find interesting, and one of the things we talk about in the book that are nice, is that the risk often that I see in the internationalizing the art world is the paradox of great art is that the most universal art is usually very specific and local, but the, and then everybody can relate to. But I think a lot of young artists get pulled into this international scene and they feel like they have to copy some international style to get pulled into. And what's great about that we're here is to make people feel the confidence in their own culture and then share that culture with the international art market and scene. And that's a brilliant idea. And just to also add to that thought, I think a very big focus of the book was um, to give context to the creative practices within El Salvador, but not to compartmentalize it in a way that we would exoticize what was going on there. And I think that's a very important. So we we, were, we had a lot of conversations about that. How do we do this and how do we handle this without making or allowing that to happen? So you traveled to Central America. What was your um, uh, impression? And did you uh, did you find that there are artists that do universal um, work by being really specific and uh, drawing from their culture and roots? Yes, you know that British artist uh, Richard Wentworth, and he did this long series called Making Do and Getting By, which is kind of prep. there is uh, there's a lot of work in Latin America, in your own Samoa too, sometimes it takes uh, detritus and things on the street and, and, and makes work from what people live with. So there's something very universal in the materiality that you see work made with things that you know you have in your own hall that anybody can relate to rather than you know, the sleek stainless steel or you know, the most rarefied uh, kinds of electronics or, or something like that. So I do think that that, but not kitsch, but you know, actual reverence for those materials. So that, I've seen that a lot. Simon, as you, 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 you could be working easily uh, in Europe or in the United States, but you, you deliberately chose to, to live and work in, in El Salvador. So what makes it special for you? Um, how is it different to work in El Salvador? Well, to begin with, uh, surfing is great in El Salvador and um, it's cheaper. And I live near the beach, so that it's hard to beat that to begin with. But really, as far as work, I need the references. I, uh, it's important for me. I, I love to travel. My work is really important to have both sides, to have that reference. But uh, really, all the source material and ideas are coming from El Salvador, from the streets, from uh, all these elements. Because you travel outside and you feel like everything has been done, or at least there's so much done. But then in El Salvador, we're not really reflecting on some of the issues, and uh, we're not really questioning so many things. Uh, so I think it's important to be there, uh, to be in real contact, in constant contact uh, with, with that reality, and also super important to travel. So I think both ways could be kind of a trap. If we go, if I go and live somewhere else, I would lose, I feel, a lot of these roots and references. Uh, but if I only stayed in El Salvador, I would also limit my language and dialogue uh, uh, regionally. So I think it's important, and I think also now Central America is just starting to come up as a different region, because it's still being called La uh, South America, and it's not. So uh, what is it that makes it different also with the Caribbean, what's the connection? So I think to be inside and moving outside is really very important. Yeah, you also move in and out. So, um, uh, why are you not moving permanently to El Salvador? <laughs> well, I think um, I think uh, you know that's that's a really good, good question. I think we're we're going to get there. I've been there for one year now, and so I've been based in New York and Mi Miami, and the, the program is still very much in pro progress. Um, so. If there's a capacity to raise enough funding, which we do do through our limited edition series and everything else, we should be able to build the program to have a full-time curator. So that's that's in the works. Maybe you should start surfing. Um, well, she you know, does. I do try. I actually yeah. have a huge bruise on my leg right now no, from, I think, from the last trip. 
I think one of the keys is that Claire does not live in El Salvador. She lives in New York. And uh, because of the diaspora of El Salvador that is not limited to just the actual physical space in Central America or territory, um, she's connected to these great culture and artists and curators that uh, would never otherwise know what's going on in El Salvador. And that's why I think it's important that she is based in Miami and New York versus really living in El Salvador. Um, and, and, and the job of a curator now, nowadays, I'm sure, as, right. as or, or, or any kind of person in the art world, is very much about having access to the rest of the world and being on the road a lot. And so we do do, we all make, we all go down actually for all of the shows which happen, uh, which will happen four or five times next, next, next year. So we're there a lot, we spend time. So let's speak about the diaspora. So um, you met many of the, of those artists. Can you tell us how is it different for artists that are in the uh, diaspora and how that that fact um, affects the work of artists from El Salvador? What, what I found the most interesting is that uh, we found artists working in um, it's not Sweden, where does um, uh, no um, Iceland, no, Sweden, Denmark. He's Sweden. He lives in Sweden. Yeah, Sweden. So he lives. There's an artist that lives in Sweden. Another one that lives in Italy. Uh, for instance, there's a few in New York, uh, Retina in LA, and you meet all of these artists that are either born in El Salvador or born of Salvadorian parents, and you look at their work, and some of them are very minimalist, but when you understand the concept and, and, and you see the artist statement, you realize that there are Salvadorian works of art because it's their roots. If you look at Retna's uh, graphics or uh, alphabet, it's based on Mayan hieroglyphics. So it's you know his mother's roots. Uh, and you see this in all of the artists. There's a, a common language or denominator that says that's where they're from. I actually have a question about that. The first thing I ever remember bringing El Salvador into my consciousness was the year I graduated from college, Joe Diddy and Salvador came out. And there's a, there are many famous passages in a very brutal book, but there is one famous passage where she describes that when you land in any country, you, there are lots of local things you need to get to know what time the museums close, where to get a taxi, where you can get a good cup of coffee. And then she describes in El Salvador the things at that time, 1982, three. What you need to get to know is what happens to the body. That the eyes are the first thing the buzzards uh, eat out, and that uh, the mouth is a perfect place for cut off groin parts to be shoved in, or if you had tenant rights disputes, that someone would stuff your mouth with the soil to say you don't get the land. A, a brutal catalog of what happened, and there were body parts and dead bodies all the time, all over. And what's interesting to me about so much beautiful in Southern art is that there's a kind of deliberate silence about the human body in much of that I'd be curious to see on what you think that is. And it seems I have seen very, very little, maybe in some ways, uh, critics that looks at people, but a lot of other removes the human body from discussion. Yeah, it's true. I think it, it has to, it goes beyond El Salvador, but it's true that we are avoiding a lot of things that uh, are too hard to choose, too, too immediate. Uh, also, uh, in the book, there's a part where we talk about the war and how artists have avoided the war uh, as a subject matter in their work. So uh, it's really complex, but um, uh, I think we are coming to terms with a lot of things still. And in, in that part, we're rediscovering our surroundings, ourselves, the, the body. But I think it was also very much used, and very, it's very related to this region, regional kind of art that we are also trying to, to stay away from, because there's a lot of cliches, and there's a lot of work like that being done. So not that we want to be contemporary, as just because being contemporary, but there are other elements that haven't been as used, and that have a, a more stronger meaning sometimes. As we have two collectors here on 
um, on the panel, I'd like to ask the non-collectors, um, what's the role of collectors in El Salvador? I don't know the situation there well, but um, in my in my travels to Latin America with uh, Isabella Mora, when we um, built up uh, our Basel Miami Beach, we noted that there is often there is not a lot of institutional support and it was actually private collectors who took over many of those functions. It was, it was, it was those who would like fund artists to go travel and uh, enable publications for them, have archives, uh, etc. And um, um, is, there so, uh, is there someone like, uh, you know, um, that is doing that in, in El Salvador? Next one. Well, um, the collector scene in El Salvador is really very conservative in the sense that collectors don't buy contemporary art. I feel um, that that there is a certain kind of need for educating a lot of the. The, the buying crowd there about contemporary art and I think that's a, going to be a very long slow process and things like this book are going to be incredibly helpful but honestly there's only been one person who's really supported the arts and that's this man over here um, there's a few more but, but in a way that's been really meaningful and I think what's also very interesting is that um, when Mario began to support the arts in El Salvador, he didn't do it by just buying art. He did it in a much more substantial and meaningful way by investing in a museum pro program. Uh, and I think it was that philanthropic uh, uh, scope that actually was uh, thanks to, to Tom and, and, and Tom, Tom's advice that has really uh, been able to put in place um, significant steps in order to build. It's the very collection. easy to tell other <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think as an artist, you really feel that there is practically no support. Uh, you're really making art because you really believe in it and you really need to do it. But you're like, you're. A lot of us have like given up on selling in El Salvador, and uh, there are many reasons for that. But I guess if we're talking about like say a subject matter gangs or violence that we're seeing every day and we're reacting to it, I can't really blame collectors for not wanting more of that in their houses. You know, like they see it outside all the time, and uh, now they're going to have it in their uh, living room. So I, I but at the end, uh, the art cannot be just like a company. You know. The, for people to live nicely in. You're also questioning a lot of things, so it's important. And um, it's been for good or bad, because at the end you do work regardless of if it's gonna sell or not, and then you can go to other places and have this wonderful freedom that some of my colleagues in the United States or other places they don't have. So that's great, but then you, you can't pay your bills with art for sure, so uh, that's also a problem. And I was talking to a friend recently from Honduras, Think of all the countries in Central America, Guatemala is the one that has the best structure. Uh, but Honduras, Nicaragua, Salvador, we, we hardly have anything. But I was telling him, like, man, we have like no collectors whatsoever. I mean, we have one, which is marvelous, which is Mario. And then uh, he said, well, you have one, you know, <laughs> like at least you have one, you know, and if it's great, then all the better. And the same with the book, you know, like how many, have we been talking to other friends from Central America, I think it's fabulous, like how many, what other country has a book that's picking up specifically a contemporary art in, in this way. So, so I think that definitely the support is hardly, but the one that we have, thank God, it's, it's wonderful. So it's, it's definitely paying off. I think Isabella and I need to go back to El Salvador and round everyone up and bring them to our Basel every year, right? So where is your work going if it's not bought by private collectors? Yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, it's going outside of El Salvador for sure because I hardly, I hardly sell, I don't sell at all in El Salvador. I, can, I don't remember when it was the last time I sold a drawing, a small drawing in El Salvador. <laughs> People like always want, yeah, it's very conservative, like Claire says, like people want oil on canvas, they want something recognizable, something calm, so it's, it's really hard for me to sell any work there. It's wonderful to make art there, it's terrible to sell. What about the, uh, what about the museum? Is, uh, is the museum collecting? Um, they do have a contemporary art, artwork space, yeah, for sure, absolutely, and I think it's starting to grow. The museum's actually only 11 years old, so they're incredibly young. Um, so the contemporary art program has been there for 10 years, and that is definitely a part of it. So and I, I think it's worth to mention that uh, it's the first building uh, that was built 
foreign museum in Central America. Uh, even Costa Rica, who has been much more advanced in the contemporary art scene, and Guatemala, uh, they don't have a museum, I mean, a building that was built from scratch to be a museum. So it's a, it's a big opportunity for the country. And, and also, I think the museums take on, an, uh, take on a very interesting role supporting a lot of the artists for things like um, traveling to the Venice Biennial. I think that's an important thing to mention, is that El Salvador's now participated for, it'll be now the fourth year, uh, where um, an artist from El Salvador has been included in the ILA uh, Pavilion. Simon showed there the last biennial, uh, Ronald Moran was before, uh, and now this year, well, Walter Eriet, and this year we have Mauritio Kovistan, who's uh, been selected by Alphonse Hook. Uh, who I think is really interesting because he's the first sound artist coming out of El Salvador, and uh, all of these amazing artists that we have brought to El Salvador make a mark, at least in one artist. Uh, we brought Steven Bitiello uh, uh, from uh, the United States. He was the first artist in El Salvador in the history of the country to really do uh, a sound exhibit in a museum. And people came looking for art and they couldn't figure out that the art was actually the sound around them. And then this one guy picked it up and has been working on sound and now he's going to be in the Venice Biennial with a sound piece. So that's the impact that all of these amazing artists that have come to El Salvador uh, have done. Um, I have in my mind the TM Sisters did the first performance. A year later we had 10 performance artists and one of them is now amazing performance artist. So, you know, uh, they come, they create kind of like a trend and then they start stifling uh, down and in the good and the bad and the good starts going up and some of them are really, I mean, I'm amazed what's going on right now. So what, is, what was the experience of Venice for you? We ate pasta. <laughs> yeah, and, wow, yeah, it, it's so big and it's huge and uh, I think one of the things was how much you need to get there. I mean, just to be selected is one thing, but also all the things that you need to be able, when I was invited, for example, the, the letter said, you know, you're invited to the Venice Biennial, you have to pay 6,000 euros just to be in that pavilion. And uh, I'm like, I don't, have, I don't even like, have that much money, and if I had it, I, would, I, I don't know if I would use it for that. Um, so it, it was mind-boggling how much money it's involved, how much of the mechanism is involved, the galleries, the role of the galleries, of the collectors, of the supporters. Uh, it was uh, impressive for me to see like behind the scene uh, all this machinery uh, that you never get a glimpse of, of coming from El Salvador. And then once you're there, you feel like you're going to be dwarfed by all these huge projects, all these huge artists, and at the end is one big uh, experience which is which is great uh, and you take a lot out of that uh, and it's great for your resume and everything uh, but a bit overwhelming too yeah so um, what about galleries are they galleries in, in salvador and how do they work with artists um there are a, a handful there's gallery one two three and the directors actually interviewed in, in our book as well and then there's espacio as well so they're uh, those are really two, uh, the, the two main ones. And there's actually a new space that's open as well, which Mario probably can tell us a little bit more about. No, I can't. Okay. Because I, I, it's I really just new. met uh, yeah. the lady over the internet yesterday. Oh. So that was really, uh, this is one of the great things happen when you realize, okay, there's all these things happening that you don't know anymore. Before I used to know everything that was going on, and now all these great things are happening that I hear from the second hand, and you go like, wow, that's great. I'm not needed anymore. <laughs> uh, so it's a new gallery that opened up. We have to go down soon. All of us, we go. But, but there's definitely not a space there that is uh, showing kind of around the world yet. So I know that uh, Espacio did do one or two art fairs and began that, that, kind of, that role, but the galleries are really kind of fulfilling a function of being in El Salvador and haven't really been able to uh, break the boundaries of showing, showing elsewhere as yet. What, what would, we, uh, would you wish is be for, um, for the art scene in El Salvador? What is missed or what could make a difference? Well, I think you need to uh, do the 360, right? Uh, have a place where artists can be educated, shown in an institutional or experimental and or experimental way. The market, you know, art galleries, which are going to need collectors. And then, of course, 
getting into the international scene. So I think that if you had 10 pieces, we've got six out of 10 right now. So in 10 years, we'll do another book with you. <laughs> and then we'll be able to tell the full story. What are your wishes? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's really important for art, for the exchange, the cultural exchange, to pick up a little bit more in El Salvador. So with Mario's initiative, a lot of artists started coming, even a lot from Miami, like the TM Sisters in Mesa mentioned, but also Bert Rodriguez, Susan Lichon, uh, a bunch of artists that came, and we have this ongoing relationship, which is great and it's helpful. So to have a little bit more of exchange, back and forth, which is what the program of Marta Contemporary is mainly about, that's going to be a huge help. It'd be great to have collectors or more people supporting, uh, not only buying art, but also supporting these kind of trips or opportunities. That would be really good. And I think we have to create also new platforms. I think artists are also, by their own, uh, trying to create new platforms for art which I think it's really the, the main thing that, that could happen that I'm wishing for, uh, uh, that have another way of happening that's not the same system. So for example, I'm really interested in doing this residency program in El Salvador that is combining art and surf. And I, I'm getting up, I have a lot of friends that do art and surf and I think for them to come and experience is great. Uh, we talk for a long time, so we're exchanging, we have barbecues and we keep on exchanging. And there's this like friendship system to it, like you don't need institution, you pay for your ticket, you can stay in my house, you know, and when I come, it, it ha it's happening that way and it's really wonderful. So I, I would wish for that to, to happen and to have like more fun, humorous thing, to not, not so serious, I mean serious with art making, but the relationship, the institutions can be a little bit more open. So I, I'm, I'm, that's what I would wish for. Tom Sachs believes in the same thing, of the art and surf. And he made me go to surf camp with him, and I broke two ribs and almost died. <laughs> I was about to say, um, I'm just aspiring to learn to surf, really. No. But um, I think when it comes to the museum program, um, we're really working very hard to create an even playing field uh, to show artists from El Salvador with the rest of the world. We have. Uh, next year, our program is featuring exhibitions with uh, Nana Tzavar, who's an artist from Israel, based in New York, uh, and also Mark, Mark, Mark Dion. So having somebody like Mark Dion coming down, doing a print work workshop is an absolutely phenomenal uh, uh, show for us to do. But then we're also um, wanting to kind of fill in the gap so that artists working in El Salvador can have the middle ground experiences it takes to be able to do a museum show. Um, I think that's really the developmental role that I'd like love to see happen. Um, about the book, how is it going to be distributed? How can people have access to the information in the book? Well, for starters, please buy one on your left. Uh, our book's DAP. Uh, it's uh, representing us in the U.S. In Miami, locally, books and books. So you'll be able, you're going to be able to buy them on the web or in different bookstores. Uh, it's a limited edition of 1,000 printed books. And the ebook, this is English only. Uh, the ebook is going to be available in the next few days. And it's going to be in iTunes. And it's going to be $4.99. And the idea is that this book is really, the goal of the book is to be educational and accessible to everyone. So a $5 fee for Latin America, it's pretty affordable and we hope that every artist and institution is going to be able to have one. And, that, and that'll be in Spanish as well. Right, my lingua. We can. So, uh, maybe are there some questions from, from the audience? We could give you a microphone if you're someone who would like to ask a question to any of Well, perhaps Sam, I can ask you a question. I know that you're also in fe featured in this book. Uh, and. Um, what was it like for you to participate in this? About a region that is obviously quite, quite small and, and really hasn't had a, had a uh, any kind of rep representation in the, in the art fair to, to speak of. How was it for, for you? Frightening, <laughs> because uh, normally I like to talk about things that I know. <laughs> so for me it was difficult as I had. I had experienced um, um, many trips to Latin America and met many artists, but I've never been to El Salvador. So for me to participate in the book was really to uh, having to think about something I know very little of. And uh, I think for, uh, that's a good thing to be in, in the book. When you're in the book, you're also reading what the other ones are writing. So I, I think I'm becoming from uh, ignorant to a little bit of uh, s someone who knows a bit more than the average on, on, on El Salvador. But uh, 
Um, I think my my contribution was very big in that. It's maybe more to put it in the context of of, of experiences I made with other countries in, in Latin America. But I, just to add to that, uh, when we were talking about the criteria of how people were selected, uh, Sam was selected because he was a catalyst to the Salvadorian art. Because when he was the director of Art Basel, this is back in 2004, I think. Um, Rod Almoran uh, exhibited, and what they call statements in the time, the one one person shows positions. Uh, so he exhibited in the positions, and his whole the entire there was one a one person show in the entire booth, which was purchased by Martin Margulis, and it's on view here in his uh, permanent collection on the second floor. So to me, uh, Sam was a catalyst that he allowed these kind of things to happen. He was a visionary that said yes. Yes, <laughs> he said. Yes, let's let's allow you know exotic things to happen in our past. It doesn't have to be only everyone that has the entire curriculum. So he gave the opportunity not only to El Salvador but to many countries uh, like El Salvador that don't have a platform to get here or to get to the Venice Biennial kind of you know big mamas of the art world. That was really one of the most be uh, beautiful. Uh, experiences to see how that uh, how that happened because the, the credit uh, has to go to the committee. You know, the selection committee um, here for our boss is really working hard and traveling around the world and spe spend, uh, spending days and days and days looking at the documents. Normally, they have a network of people um, that have information. They have seen the artists. They've been to the to the to the galleries. They've seen them in other art fairs. But then comes an application from a gallery they don't know, with an artist they don't know the project which isn't done yet. So um, um, I was very courageous to from the committee to say, it sounds interesting, let's let's give it a try. And um, we were very happy that it could not only be realized, but it was really the talk of the fair in, in that year. Many people came and it made such a difference to um, for many people to see the artist for the first time and then to know that it goes into a great collection and that people can see it permanently. And um, uh, so I think that's one of the good things art fairs can do. And I think one of the things that I'm very happy about our Basel my Beach that it's not just that, there's really hundreds and, th and thousands of connections that have been done between people, um, especially an exchange between Latin America and North America and the, uh, the rest of the world, which just happened because people were here in the, in the same place. And I, um, if I think back in the 1990s, how so few um, Latin American artists were in the programs of major um, of ma major galleries or museums, and how immensely that has changed. Now there's almost no gallery that doesn't have artists from Latin America, and also how the exchange has gone in the other way. How many how many uh, collectors now have collectors which uh, are mixing international with their local artists, and uh, so I think that's a good thing. This uh, the fair has been has been doing and uh, we were happy to be a small part of them. Okay, so thank you all for, for participating.